Welcome to Brain Ponderings. I'm Mark Matson, the host. And today the topic is microglia, these intriguing cells in the brain. Uh, most people think the brain, they think in neurons that convey electrochemical activity and mediate all our behaviors. But there's several other cell types, and one's a microglia, and it's kind of equivalent to a peripheral macrophage that's involved in surveilling tissues. And if there's an infection or an injury, they have immediate important responses. But my guest today, um, Professor Long John Wu, has a lot of evidence that, and others do, that microglia play normal roles in the uninjured, uninfected brain in modifying neural network activity and probably in responses to various normal things the brain does. Um, so Professor Wu, he's uh, right now he's in transition from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where he's professor of neuroscience, neurology, and immunology. He's moving down to Houston to the University of Texas Health, um, what is it, Health Science Center in Houston. And they recruited him down there uh, to, as the founding director of the Institute for Molecular Medicine Center for Neuroimmunology and gliobiology, and he also is going to wear several other hats down there in uh, various uh, programs and, and departments. So welcome, Long John. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> glad to be in um, um, Brain Brim Palm Pondering. It's a very nice program. Yeah. And you, so you're from China originally, and you, you were at a prominent, you're, your PhD work there was a, what I gather is a very prominent uh, institute. And I look back at your publications, you, and I, actually I was remarkable, the number of publications, I, I don't know if that was all your PhD work or you also did like a postdoc there, but can you talk a little bit about that? You learned electrophysiology there, I guess? Yeah, um, um, yes, I, I did my PhD training uh, uh, in mostly in China, so uh, in um, University of Science and Technology of China. Uh, my uh, my uh, PhD mentor, Tian Le Xu, he actually was trained with uh, uh, Akai K um, in, in Japan, so it's a, a lot of you know, like physiology background. That's I, I Long June, I have a connection to that. I had a, a very good electrophysiology postdoc uh, from Japan, uh -huh. Kasatoshi Furukawa, who had a nice nature paper in my lab uh, showing how they secreted forms of amyloid precursor protein, uh, quiet neural network activity by opening potassium channels. And oh. hyperpolarizing, but anyway, he he trained with Akeike. Oh, yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah. So I that that's where I got trained uh, with Tanner Xu when I was PhD. Uh, but during the last year of my PhD, I went to University of Toronto as a visiting student. Oh. I trained with Ming Zhuo. Uh, more, um, uh, I mean, trained Ming Zhuo trained with Eric Kandel, so on plasticity part. So uh, yeah, so during my PhD is more about ion channel, neuronal ion channel. And then a uh, graduate transition to uh, slab plasticity. That's that was my uh, PhD training, and uh, I uh, I was uh, in uh, in Rust Toronto for almost a year, and then went back to China to defend my PhD. And then I uh, that was two thousand four, and then I went went to uh, Ming's lab in Toronto again to finish up the project. That's become mm -hmm. my early postdoc. Yeah, so you see the it's a lot of. Uh, I mean, a lot of papers just because uh, I, I I was uh, I was in. I um, see. Kind of, and you you had an interest early on in chronic pain because uh, I guess they were working on that in the labs, and uh, which is a big problem. I actually personally I have chronic pain, and it's actually caused by a, a, a gene mutation in a in a sodium voltage dependent sodium channel, uh, and it, it's a gain of function mutation, so that. The channel open more easily, so I have kind of a low threshold for pain. So is that NAV one point eight or different? Um, uh, one point nine. One point nine. Wow. Yeah. So and I, uh, I actually uh, consulted with Steve Waxman. Right. At Yale about this, and he, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
my so the sodium channels this kind of some background here that uh sodium channel is the main channel that the positively charged sodium ions rush through and depolarize or excite the neuron and they're involved in propagation of the impulses and um so there's these rare genetic disorders where there's mutations in uh, one of three sodium channels essentially that are expressed in the pain conveying neurons and some of these mutations are like mine uh, there's actually some mutations that also eliminate pain sensation uh, but anyway you you did work on pain and inflammation because there's inflammation and pain are kind of closely related and i guess that's how you got interested in microglia because they're involved in inflammation yeah that's uh that's one of the reasons yes uh when I when I was in a PhD, that I work on this um, channel called acid sensing iron channel. Oh. So that channel is very important to sense the the low pH acidosis, right? And so it's a, a proton uh, channel, a hydro uh, hydrogen ion. No, yeah. actually, it's a proton gated iron channel. So it's a sodium oh. channel. But when there is acidosis, oh. the channel open. I That's see. why, they, like acidosis, will induce pain because of that channel get open. Yeah, right? I see. So in DRG neuron have that channel, then the spinal cord have that channel. That's how I um I enter into a pain field. I studied oh. that channel. And then when I was in Ming Zhou's lab, so he trained with Aaron Kandel, Eric Kandel, but he was early training was all about pain circuits. So we are studying the cortical mechanism of pain. So then in the anterior singular cortex, we study anterior singular cortex plasticity related to the pain and the pain emotion. So that's mm -hmm. why. I, my early training is uh, is all, all in the pain field about the neural ion channel and uh, and the pain circuits. But then um, you are you are totally right because in the neural inflammation, particularly in uh, early two thousand, there is a, a number of uh, studies show that microglia could be important role uh, play important role in pain. That's why mm -hmm. you know, pay attention to microglia. But really, and the that, that was uh, Linda Watkins. That yeah, Linda Watkins, uh, they, they were early studies on glia, uh, yeah. not only just the uh, microglia, but she's more at that time on astrocyte uh, uh -huh. in, in, in pain. Uh, but uh, like like Mike Sauter, you know, way, all this group um, show that how microglia could uh, not only like, uh, you know, uh, it's a sufficient, you know, uh, but but it really is a, it's a can trigger the pain if activate the microglia yeah. receptors like P2X4, yeah. Okay, and and but this is how you got interested in the 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 hypothesis or idea that microglia are involved normally in our norm the normal functions. You know, in the absence of pain or any problem, they are affecting neural network activity. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that that kind of more recent work, right? Uh, we we after we know more and more about the microglia, we now know microglia not only play important role in, in in disease context because those are most obvious. When all the disease context, almost any brain disturbance, you will activate microglia. You know, if you do immunostaining, you will see microglia proliferation, microgliosis, morphology change. That's easy to, to observe. That's why most studies early days always about microglia disease. Well, most recent evidence show that microglia also play a critical role in maintaining the brain homeostasis. So I was really drawn into the field by that early study. I mean, not that early now, almost like 20 years ago, 2005. There's two papers, one from uh, Wimbiel Gans group, one another from Hamilton's group. They show first time microglia in vivo imaging. That's really... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, make me so excited because I already pay attention to microglia and at that time, I was doing a lot of uh, plasticity LTP recording. You know, I get a little bit bored by every day sitting there doing LTP. And then, then, then I, I these two papers came out of this microglia like dancing in the brain. You know, constantly serve the Can brain. Can you talk a little bit about uh, microglia? Um, kind of the basics, a little bit about them. Um, right, right, right. So yeah. microglia is a brain resident immune cells. Yeah. And because they're the immune cells, they have to like you know try to understand the, the the environment, right? So they are so one property, amazing property, is a microglia, unlike any other cell type in the brain, is that they are 
constantly moving. Mm -hmm. They're moving, not cell body moving. So if you look in, in real image, you can you can you can visualize every microglia and their processes, right? So the the cell body is not moving much, but all the process constantly mm -hmm. move. So they move one micrometer per minute. They scan the whole brain uh, a parenchyma. So it's just amazing. I was so excited when I see these two paper came out. I would say, wow, this something maybe is interesting there. That's how I really start uh, uh, like working on microglia and start also from microglia imaging. Um, imaging microglia and then, because I'm an electrophysiologist, so I also do the recording in microglia to see when they move, what the membrane potential change, you know, how how this membrane potential or uh, channel open in microglia relate to their function, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's really intriguing. I, I was really struck by those movies you know, movies of the microglia processes moving around. And it's, I mean, it, it it's intuitively they they're somehow probing, probing around and kind of searching for something or responding to signals. And there have to be some signals that, you know, determine how much they're moving, where they're moving and so on. Right, exactly. So the, if you give a, like, if it's a brain injury, right? So we, we, we shine the laser, it's an it's a injury, and you will see microglia process all go to the, the oh, injury yeah. site in, almost immediately, within like 20 or 30 minutes. The, all the process was around that, that injury site. So imagine you know, anything happening in the brain, microglia will be the first responder. They, found, they, they, they can sense it right away. So for the injuries uh, right now, it's well it's, it's known now for the mechanism, for example, because uh, when there's injury, they will release ATP. And uh, microglia express a plethora of ATP receptor. One signature receptor in microglia called P2R1, uh, 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 12, P2R12. Yeah. So it's an ATP receptor. And they can sense ATP and ADP. And they, they the receptor, control their movement to the, to the ATP uh, injury site. That, that, that's really intriguing. So as everyone knows, ATP is like the energy currency in cells. It's produced in mitochondria. And it's normally inside the cell, but when neurons get injured, it's released from the cell and that's a signal for the microglia. And then one well-known function of microglia and macrophages is to remove debris, to remove you know, damaged parts of cells or even maybe entire cells, uh, if cells are dying in a certain way called apoptosis. Yes, yes. So microglia, uh, uh, this chemotaxis is one of function to to kind of detect the environment. But another major function is that they yes, they they like brain scavenger, right? They they can get rid of the the, the debris, uh, clean up the garbage, and uh, and and then at the same time they also release all uh, these chemokines and uh, cytokines and uh, communicate with the environment as well. So they they consider inflammatory cells, um, right? In the a, you know, in, in a brain injury, like if it's a trauma or a stroke, some of the neurons in the most severely affected area, they just rupture and burst, a process called necrosis. But at a, like further distance where there's some damage or stress to the neurons, they may die by another mechanism called apoptosis where they don't burst and actually they retain their contact contents, but there's this change in the outer membrane of the cell having to do with the lipid flipping to the outer part. And that's a signal for microglia to come in and, and remove the cell. So with apoptosis, a neuron can die and not cause much inflammation at all. Right. Um, and Long John, I, I think you know this. So Back when I was at Kentucky in the 1990s, back then I was still doing some experiments myself. Uh -huh. and, and I found that that in individual synapses, this apoptotic changes can occur and this flipping of the lipid phosphatidylserine to the outer part can occur. And that's a signal for the microglia. And so we published that paper in 1998. It was called Evidence for Synaptic apoptosis and and in the in the discussion you know we hypothesized that 
this may be a me mechanism for synaptic pruning. So wow. I think I think ours yeah. was the first paper on that. Wow. And then other we didn't really follow up on it much, but other labs followed up on it. Right, right, right. Indeed, yeah. So microglia have the receptors can can recognize the PS, right? They talk about the yeah uh, receptor. They talk about the uh, trim two, so they can they can recognize this uh, lipid uh, uh, change on the, on the apoptotic uh, cells, and then they how they 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 they, they have this phagocytosis function towards those uh, um, even synapse. Yeah, and that. That also suggests a potentially good role. We'll get to de brain development and plasticity in a second, but since we're on injury and disease, um, that also suggested a potentially good role for microglia because I think, and many people think, synapses are where degenerative processes first begin, particularly if you know have glutamate excitatory synapse. Um, so the idea there would be in a stroke or traumatic injury, the energy level in the neurons compromise, but they're continuing to be stimulated by glutamate at those synapses. And so that can lead to degeneration of those synapses, but maybe the microglia are somehow removing the degenerating synapse and that can maybe indirectly protect the rest of the neuron yes that... yes that's that's kind of the um the rule probably the like a, the 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 main rule for microglian disease is try to you know do the, the later do the repair or to maintain the the homeostasis go back to the homeostasis right so that they they, they have this function to remove the debris remove the dead cells and remove the 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 the, the inactive synapses even Right. Um, um, but I mean, the neuroprotective rule could happen in many different uh, folds. Um, for example, in seizure context, where we show that microglia even able to dampen uh, neuronal activity. So when there's hyperactivity there, they will attract microglia, uh, go to interact with neuron. And the main, the main function there is that they, 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 they go there, try to protect, uh, protect neuron to by reducing their their neural activity. So um, then, then the that more in the acute uh, phase, right? But then in the in the later uh -huh. phase, there's a lot of spontaneous. The microglia become inflammatory cell could also play like bad or good, depend on the context as well. Even yeah. that in the later phase, microglia still play a role as a phagocytosis of the dead cells. But same time become they, but they they become inflammatory, so they they could uh, could you know uh, exacerbate the, the the situation. Yeah, and this this kind of general idea has also been proposed and evidence for in just tissue injury in the periphery. If you have some injury to your knee or your ankle or something like that, uh, in the acute phase, it's it's probably good to have those macro macrophages activated. Uh, and in fact, there's evidence from clinical oh. studies that. If people are treated with anti-inflammatory agents during the acute phase of the injury, it can actually impair the healing mm -hmm. process. Right, right. So like but, they, they definitely like have very similar rule like between uh, like microglia and the peripheral uh, macrophages. Yeah. yeah but they, they're different, of course. And, uh, and this context is uh, important. Okay, and then then the question becomes, so in, in, can you talk a little bit about brain development and, and the role for microglia? Where do they come from? The microglia, do they come from the bone marrow where macrophages come from, or do they come from somewhere else during brain development? Is that no? Yeah, that, that, that is an yeah, important question, right? So uh, we recently addressed... Um, um, so I'm not really the guy doing brain development, but uh, mm -hmm. can tell a little bit about the uh, microglia development is that it's it's a different from uh, uh, other brain cells like a neuron or or or, or astrocyte. So they have they 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 invade into brain epithelium in very very early days, like 8.5, uh, 
So they they uh -huh. reside there, become mic uh microglia, and then they 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 like maintain self maintain. So um so it's it's more like a alien in the brain, right? <laughs> and from developmental point of view, and the function of the microglia in development, um yeah, it's a it's a it's a big topic in the field. So um um right now, like we know, the microglia is important for brain circuits formation is because of the you know, they maintain the synapses or they try to prune the synapses during uh, development. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, we, we, my lab mainly focus on adult brain. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about how microglia could regulate and to sense and regulate neuronal activity and then engage into the neuronal circuits in the adult and in the disease context. But then in the adult, do, do, do microglia divide or can, can, uh, but can I guess monocytes can bone marrow cells uh, give rise to cells that get into the brain and become microglia? Uh, yes, at least in the disease context, this is a uh, well established. In adult, uh, in a no. in a in a healthy brain, uh, most of us will agree there is no monocyte. Uh, like a like a like incorporation incorporate into microglia okay. population, but there's some some evidence at least the monocyte will become um, they call bought a social macrophage. You know, in the brain, not only microglia is a, more like a, in the parenchyma, but then the different location like meninges, right, in the paravascular space or in coral plexus, there is there's macrophage. They call border social macrophage. Some of them uh, uh, could be replaced by the bone marrow, uh, like monocytes. I see. But the the, the healthy brain and microglia, the consensus I think in the field is that they will microglia will self self repopulate. So no no need for a monocyte. But in the disease context, right? Um, you will see when the BBB compromised, or not even BBB compromised, the 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 disease context, you will see the monocyte can. Get into the the diseased uh, or, or, or damaged yes. area, so yeah. become microglia like cell. Okay. And then, what about the the mechanism? So you described, uh, you know, ATP is a signal for microglia, and um, mi microglia produce. You know, I guess the first things that were discovered as pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, tumor necrosis factor, TNF, or interleukin-1 beta. Um, and, and for a long time, you know, that these, they're called pro-inflammatory cytokines, but they do, they have very important roles in normal tissues in the absence of an injury or infection. And in fact, I think we were actually the first to show a good a good effect of TNF on neurons in uh, early 1990s. Just in culture experiments, we showed that if we pretreat cultured hippocampal neurons with TNF, it can protect them against excitotoxicity or against glucose deprivation. We even did amyloid beta peptide, and then we found that this cell survival promoting effect of TNF involved a transcription factor called NF kappa B. And actually we had, we had trouble getting these papers published because the uh, kind of the dogma was that TNF and activation of NF kappa B is bad. <laughs> you know, and, and we were saying no, it's good. It's promoting survival. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's 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 really a uh, interesting work, right? Early early days I proposed that that uh, uh, TNF function, I mean, in a protective function. So even even the later, the people talk about how TNF regulate uh, synaplasticity, right? Um, Actually, we were the first to show that. Through that, wow. Yeah, yeah. that was then, a lot, um, lot of the Malanka's group to talk about, you know, how the TNF, you know. Uh, yeah, so we, we we did all this work on TNF in the '90s, and we published in. Well, actually, some of those good journals, we did some studies in TNF receptor knockout mice and had a Nature Medicine paper in 96 showing that TNF receptor knockout mice, neurons in their brain are more vulnerable to seizures or a stroke. That's very interesting. Yeah, 
we, you know, when we study microglia, we, we always try to uh, uh, push that. I mean, it's, uh, there's evidence there. So microglia, it's not an inflammatory cell always bad. You know, in right. the early days when we talk about microglia always they are inflammatory bad, you know, yeah. to the brain. But we found in uh, particularly in a, a, a acute uh, context, you know, they, they try to protect it. They kind of try to be a, a good guy yeah. there. So so we we focus more on, but we focus more on this dynamics interaction yeah. because we do a lot of imaging, right? Yeah. So we we found that when you when you when you fire a neuron and you found the microglia will go to interact with neuron. So then we you know we we say uh, we observed that this phenomenon and then we dissect the mechanism. So ATP P twelve twelve is one of the major mechanism drive microglia to sense this hyperactive neuron, and then when they in, when they interact, you know, dry microglia go to the neuron and then their interaction. So how this interaction, we found the interaction could be neuroprotective, right? How this interaction become neuroprotective? That's still as an active like a research field uh, right now, topic right now in the field. So Adam Delis group show there is a, this, they, 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 they found this uh, um, uh, like very specified structure they call a purinergic junction. Basically it's a, it's a P2 R12 receptor in microglia, but in a, in the neuron side, there's a you know, potassium channel reach, enrichment, even mitochondria is there. So oh. uh, they call the purinergic junction. And then, then and Shaffer's group show, you know, the microglia go there, not only to sense a, a ATP, but it can degradate ATP eventually, uh, use actor enzyme eventually degrade ATP to adenosine. That's why microglia mm -hmm. are, are, are neuro, neuroprotective. So we have early evidence already show like, when you use P2R12 knockout, you know, if microglia cannot respond to this and the seizure will, 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 will increase. So, right so it's now. like a second, it's a second breaking mechanism to, to prevent ab, abnormal hyperexcitability. Exactly. You know, so, so we normally think GABA, you have GABAergic neurons and they inhibit the excitatory glutamatergic neurons. But what you're saying, there's a mechanism where microglia can also cause even local uh, suppression of activity when it gets really high. Kind of a, uh, so would that, is that feedback occur over periods of minutes or hours? How, how quickly does that occur when you increase the activity in the neuron? So that, that occurred in the minute scale. Minute. So, so yeah, because microglia, if you if we if we uh, perfuse glutamate to the brain size, for example, yeah. we can visualize both neuron and microglia. So within a few minutes, you will see microglia will send the process climbing along the dendrite, climbing along the cell body. So that's the minutes uh, like a scale. And then if you don't have this, then this neural activity cannot you know cannot be contained. So you will, that's why in the mice without P twelve twelve, like uh, most mice have a much stronger seizure. Than the in the knockout compared with white type mice because they the, the microglia cannot sense this uh, neuronal hyperactivity anymore. We did a lot of early work with calcium imaging way back uh, in the 1980s because uh, then I was at uh, Colorado State University and doing developmental neurobiology, but I was studying effects of glutamate on neurons, oh. and um, it just happened that. Ben Cater, the head of my lab, was good friends with Roger Chen, who uh, he got Nobel Prize. Uh, you know, it was the Nobel Prize was kind of, in his case, yeah, he contributed a lot to green fluorescent protein and making red and all that. But I think his most important work was to make these fluorescent calcium indicator yeah. dyes that you can get in neurons and their fluorescence changes with changes in calcium. So anyway, we did a lot of work on excitotoxicity and came to the conclusion that, you know, the magnitude of the calcium rise is not quite as important as how long calcium levels stay up. So when a neuron stimulated by glutamate or when it fires a potential, the calcium channel is open, calcium goes in and calcium levels can go very high and particularly in dendrites and you know postsynaptic regions of dendrites but then as long as they come down you know within a minute or two the cell is fine but if you have a situation where the calcium levels 
stay up even at lower calcium levels, stay up for 10 minutes or more, then the cell will die. So maybe these, you know, this effect of microglia is very important in preventing that sustained elevation in calcium that we think plays an important role in in the, the in, in degenerative conditions. Yes, yes. Uh, even in the neurodegeneration, right? Uh, a lot of neuronal hyperactivity happened in the uh, oh, yeah. before, yeah, before they neurodegenerate. Uh, they degenerate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, so we are now actually interested in the in the neurodegenerative context, right? How microglia sense this uh, neuronal hyperactivity and what function there? Yeah, so, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, and I was actually, you know, then for neurodegeneration part, I really uh, thank uh, for uh, thank you for introducing me to the field. You know, the TDB forty three neurodegeneration we collaborate that project. Yeah. Basically, you know, we borrow them the, the viral model from your lab. You know, you knew what that was in your lab that time. Yeah. And I came to my lab, you know, to 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 use this model but study microglia function there. So. Uh, yeah, um, he was a, he was a great postdoc and had a really important paper for my lab on the, um, right, right, actually right. intermittent fasting and how it can enhance GABAergic tone. It was, at, at, you know, very I like that paper, you know, and, uh, we had a lot of discussion with Yong in the lab, in the lab and uh, and uh, talk about how the mitochondria, you know, contribute to that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing work. And I think he's doing well. He went, my the, the viewers and listeners, um, some of you may know this, others may not. Um, China is rapidly moving ahead of the United States in terms of basic research. Uh, you know, I mentioned this work we did on TNF in the early 1990s, and my, my the first postdoc I had was from China. He did some work with neurotrophic factors and then TNF and some other things, had some nice papers. And I had, had many other postdocs from China. And for, I'd say, into the even early 2000s, none of them would, none of them would go back to China. I, I don't think they even thought of going back to China. But then, you know, in the, certainly by 2010 and till now, these outstanding postdocs, you know, that do research in the United States, they get much better set up, lab set up and and facilities and opportunities in China than they can find in the United States. So yeah. so, you know, if young people are listening to this, uh, you know, we need more young people, bright young people going into basic science. Uh, it's very important, uh, you know, not just for science, but actually for the country, I think. Exactly. So, so uh, back to Young News case. Uh, actually, he got a, even uh, he got a offer from National Singapore University. Yeah. And then he got an even better offer from China. So, like, I yeah. think that's the reason now. Now he's doing great there. Yeah. Yeah. Asia's really South Korea too has, and Japan. They all have excellent science now. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, why don't you talk about the cutting edge methods you're using uh, that we never got to use in my lab before I retired. Maybe if I still had a lab, we'd start using them. Optogenetics and chemogenetics. What are these methods? And, and you have really exciting papers published, I assume, in the works using these methodologies. Right. So, so you know, the, the optogenetic chemogenetics really used so widely in the neuroscience field, but mostly for neuronal like manipulation. Yeah. Um, for glia, particularly for microglia, you know, we know very little about their membrane potential, right? The, you know, the ion channel in microglia, not, not that well studied. That's why, you know, there's a really lag behind for optogenetics uh, in microglia. But you know, I was trained at electric physiology. I was doing microglia recording, and the microglia still have like a plasma channel, enriched plasma channel. Yeah. And now, when I was postdoc with David Clapham at Harvard, so I was working on the voltage gated proton channel, 
um, you know, that, that channel is an amazing channel in microglia. And uh, even the normal context compared with other channels, that's already enriched there. Um, the reason is that because they, the activation require really high voltage. So they don't, they, the nature just put the iron channel there to, to be ready instead of like they, they wait for the iron channel to travel to the membrane. So there is an iron channel there already. Um, that's how I, I got interested into the, this optogenetic tool in microglia. And what we found is that if we, if we just shine the light to activate the iron channel in the, 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 the channel redoption, we use a red activate channel redoption called reach. So when they open the channel, so basically you can excite the, the, the neuronal circuits. So now from microglia to directly translate to neuronal circuits and to the behavior, we measure the pain behavior. So even with uh, with the short-term stimulation, you call we call the we cause the pain uh, uh, hypersensitivity in, in mice for for like for, for for days. You know when we just stimulate like half hour of. So microphone. so you are so you have this uh, gene. There's a gene encoding this channel redopsin. It's a bacterial protein actually. That's an ion channel. So it's not normally in any any of our cells. And so you're. You use a viral vector to introduce this into the. How do you get that gene for the channel redoption into the microglia and where? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So for for most of the neuronal field, right? People use virus. That's very very easy way. But interesting for microglia, this is still um, still an important topic in the field. How we oh. use viral approach to uh, to you know express genes in microglia. Mm -hmm. So microglia are notoriously difficult in fact, because they are immune cells. They know how to you know, battle those virus. So uh -huh. in microglia field, we still lack a very good tool to, uh, to virally infect microglia. So right now, what we did is that we use genetic mice. We use the microglia cre mice and then uh, with, uh, with channel resonance flux mice. So that way we oh, can specifically express the, the channel redoption into microglia. Now, uh -huh. because as you mentioned that, you know, that's a channel only in, I mean, not endogenously in a mice. So now, now we can, you know, express that only in microglia, then we can use the light, right, to activate the, the microglia. So for that specific, we is expressed in our whole body, I uh, see. but I it's see. only in microglia or, or depend on the Cree. So we did with stimulation, temp, like especially uh, we can control that with uh, where you put your, Stimulation, right? So we can stimulate the spinal cord, or we can stimulate the brain. So what we what we showed or we reported is that we 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 shine the light to the spinal cord, so we can activate the spinal cord microglia, particularly dorsal horn microglia, and then that will trigger pain. Yeah. Just when we just stimulate the microglia alone, uh, it can trigger pain. So we 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 name it more like microgliogenic pain because you know you only start from microglia, now you have a pain behavior. But but is this is this channel adoption also in macrophages or only in microglia? Uh, very good question. So the uh, early days, you know, the when we don't have a very good tool to separate these two populations because right. the microglia and macrophage they have very uh, uh, they have almost similar like developmental yeah. region. So so they share a lot of molecules, right? So the early early like uh, tools like six six hour and Cree mice were using that that will target both microglia and the macrophage. So for right now, right now there are several different uh, uh, new tools came up only in targeted microglia. Ah, so okay. yeah, we, we were, that time we were only using uh, uh, like uh, 6 to cr one Cree. So we cannot really tell only microglia or uh, macrophage. But you think about in the, in the spinal cord, in the central nervous system, the border social macrophage is a very small population, right? So probably one tenth of the total population of microglia. So, so, so we believe still is main. Actually, in, in, you know what I was thinking? So what, what's the, the wavelength of light that activate the, the channel adapts in the sodium channel? What wavelength? Yeah, so it depends on the, uh, what uh, channel adoption you are using, right? Okay. So if you use, you use the like uh, traditional channel adoption that you know, it's blue light, you can activate it. So uh, we 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 used the uh, uh, red active channel adoption. That now is Roger Roger Chen. The, the reason I asked the macrophage is kind of a, a silly but interesting. I've, 
you know, if it's in macrophages, you have macrophages in your your skin. So uh -huh. then if you get exposed to light, it would activate the macrophages in the skin. Already. Uh, yeah, already, right? So probably that's oh, you mean the you mean the when we when we have a channel reduction. Right, when, yeah, yeah. Yeah. when we when we shine the light. Yeah. Because, I mean, what we, what we did is that we have optic fiber on the top of the uh, spinal cord. So uh -huh. it's not like you just shine the light. No, no, no. But I was saying if if macrophages had it, there's macrophages in the skin. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, the, the... In the, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, if that that's a mice could be used for that purpose and see what's what's going on, right? We, we haven't tested that. So we did a spinal cord stimulation. Now current projects, we also did a brain uh, stimulation to see when we stimulate a uh, um, uh, microglia, what happened to the behavior. But the but the paper we published in Plus Biology, that paper is about when we trigger the microglia channel adoption, and we trigger pain. Yeah. But that's not the purpose, right? We we want to treat pain instead of uh, right trigger pain. So the next step, really, we are trying to find different stimulation pattern whether those different similar patterns will trigger microglia release different things. Because the one, the one we showed, uh, when, we, when we give a microglia stimulation cause pain, basically we bombard microglia and then they release the R1 beta. Those are the uh, pro-inflammatory mediator. That's the reason if you, treat, if you uh, stimulate microglia will, will cause the pain. But we think maybe if we give a different like a pattern of stimulation, right? Uh -huh. so microglia may release, you know, different uh, mediators, uh, huh. even anti-inflammatory mediators, maybe will treat pain. So that's kind of the next step we are working on right now is that uh, uh, um, we try to harness the power of microglia or overall like how the, how the power of neuroimmunology to treat brain diseases. That's also the mission of my new center in Houston is that by understanding all this, right, this uh, neuroimmune interaction or crosstalk yeah. between the immune system, nervous system, and then understanding that, then we can manipulate that, right? We can manipulate this neuroimmune mechanism and to eventually to treat brain diseases. That's kind of the long-term mission. Um, that's what we're doing with this, even the microglia stimulation channel adoption, you know, to to uh, to to study their function, but also in the long term, how we can. Uh, use the microglia to, to treat brain diseases. Yeah, the, the pain areas, you know, the opioids is a terrible problem now. And it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that for decades and decades and decades, there have been really not any, you know, clear breakthroughs that where there's some Drug, but the spinal the stimulation is interesting because some patients with chronic pain that don't aren't responding well to anything or what they do spinal cord stimulation. Do you think there's a role for microglia in the clinical benefit of spinal? Because I think most people who do this stimulation are assuming that they're modulating the activity yeah. directly of the neuron. Exactly. Exactly. Great question. We actually have a project on this, and also come uh, work with company. Um, um, they 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 did, uh, design a, a small uh, stimulator in the in the mouse because usually right now for the spinal stimulation usually for rats or for big animals. So we have that small uh, stimulator to to stimulate the uh, uh, spinal cord of the mice, and we try to understand the glial mechanism of this uh, spinal cord stimulation. That's a, yeah. yes, exactly. That's the idea is that right now, all the focus is, is on, on, on neuron, right? When you stimulate, obviously, neuron will respond. Uh, but, you know, glial cells have uh, all kinds of like ion channels. They can respond, they can sense this uh, elect electric uh, change and membrane potential change. So how these glial cells are involved? That's exactly the idea we, we when the, when the company see uh, our paper, they are interested to see like whether we can uh, uh, study microglia stimulation and uh, how they will relate yeah. to, to pain treatment. Because in the clinic, right, spinal cord stimulation is already known to treat uh, some some chronic pain, yeah. but the mechanism is not known well. Yeah. So our job is uh, try to understand the microglia role uh, in this in this uh, spinal cord stimulation. Yeah, that's very great. That's great work, and then. You've also so you've used optogenetics uh, in the brain too to 
target microglia in certain brain area and then look at behavior? Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's unpublished one. So, but that's something oh. we we're, we're actively working on because the spinal cord, you know, we we link to the pain, but in the brain, different brain area, right? To see how microglia activated or when the channel activation microglia, how they will engage in the neuronal circuits uh -huh. and in the, uh, all kinds of behavior. Yeah, you know, that's kind of an ongoing project right now. Okay, um, so we have to stay tuned for that. You're not gonna you're not gonna tell us anything yet on what you're finding. <laughs> not, I mean, it's, but but there are there are some papers though uh, where microglia are manipulated in other ways that suggest roles in behavior, right? Right, right, right. So chemo genetics is another way to manipulate. Ah. Uh, you know the, you know, for microglia, the ion channel is not the main thing. Or at least we don't know much about ion channel. But the 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 G -pro GPCR or G protein coupled signaling. It's a it's a, another main way the signaling for microglia. So like the the receptor I talked about ATP receptor is a GI couple receptor. There is yeah. a lot of GQ couple receptor as well. So yeah, we are we also work on the 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 chemo genetics uh, manipulation of microglia and uh, see how they will engage into the neuronal circuits and the function and the disease context as well. So we 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 have this uh, study on also on pain. We can we can manipulate the GI signaling. If we stimulate GI signaling in microglia, we can dampen the activation of microglia by nerve injury, and then we we, we can partially relieve the relieve the pain uh, in mice. So ah, that's and, that's our research. In, in in which brain region? That's also in the spinal cord. Oh, that's in the spinal cord. So in the spinal cord, the uh, dorsal horn. Okay, so chemogenetics, um, what, so th this works, there's um, some ion channel that's genetically engineered to respond to a certain chemical, is that? Uh, uh, yeah, so chemogenetics is more like a, um, like a, a modified uh, GPCRs, right? So, um, so ah, it's, oh, it's I see. right, uh, uh, design receptor. I see, oh, I see. By the, the design uh, ligand, right? So. So so it's a, it's a it's a GPCR but uh, but but it's a it's a modified and they ha they have a we we use artificial ligand like CNO uh, DCZ now to activate the those uh, receptor and then they engage in the signaling we can control oh, okay. the GI coupled or GQ coupled or GS coupled yeah that that's the chemogenetic okay so so Dr Wu is talking about so these. G protein coupled receptors are proteins in the membrane, and of some and so for example, uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, kind of normal transmitters we hear about. That's the kind of class of receptor that uh, Dr. Wu is talking about, and so this GI there's a second messenger, uh, a molecule called cyclic AMP that uh, it's very important in learning and memory. It's actually uh, kind of uh, synergizes with calcium, plays a role in learning and memory. And there was a Nobel Prize given for the discovery of cyclic AMP, a guy named Earl Sutherland. This was a long, a long time ago. And, um, but anyway, so there are receptors that increase the amount of cyclic AMP in cells and their receptors that decrease the amount of cyclic AMP. So what you're doing in the microglia is you're, you add a drug, you give a drug to the animal and it reduces the amount of cyclic AMP in, yes. in, 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 in the spinal cord microglia. Right, right. So again, we use a, 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 a transgenic mice to right? express that. Oh, okay. Yeah, we use a transgenic mice to express a, the the receptor yeah, yeah. in my in microglia because again, this is artificial yeah. kind of a designed receptor. Yeah. Right? Like Brian Ross uh, was pioneer of this field. So, so we we use that approach to like express this design receptor in in microglia, right? It's exclusively in microglia. Now we can use a ligand, an artificial ligand. Like CNO to activate the, the this receptor and this receptor we can use different engage in different signaling so we can we can put a GI coupled drugs right yeah. chemogenetic so then we'll only activate GI signaling so we'll reduce cyclin CMP 
Um, so when we, we did that, then we activate GI signaling exclusively in microglia, so we can dampen the activity of microglia in response to this nerve injury. So because in this context, when microglia get activated, they, they basically promote like neural activity and promote pain. So if we can dampen their yeah. activity, so basically we can reduce the, the chronic pain. And do microglia have, they, do they have the uh, receptors that reduce any, are there any chemicals, uh, do they have receptors for any chemicals that will reduce cyclic AMP? Yes, I mean, the, there's, there's a lot of GI uh, receptor in microglia. Uh, if you think about, you know, microglia dynamics and movement, a lot of receptor control that, the GI receptor, couple receptor control the movement. Right, but but I guess what I'm getting at are there are are chemicals that will reduce pain that normally yeah this is become very complicated right when you have a complete when you have a chemicals that can in, reduce, activate receptor in microglia but then usually they will have a receptor in neuron as well so yeah. it will affect neuronal function that's why the cool thing about this chemogenetic op genetics is that we can specifically yeah. manipulate microglia to to study their function. But yeah. if you go back to clinical, right, you have to think about side effects. You have to think about, you know, how this specifically only in microglia, not in other yeah. cell type, or not particularly not in neuron. Otherwise, you will, you, you, you'll get some unwanted effect from neuronal like uh, stimulation, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So microglia, that, I mean, they have a lot of GI couple receptor. We being a, a study, all this, you know, all these microglia dynamics, we, Another important approach in my lab is using in vivo imaging, right? We do even awake mice. You know, when mice is running around, we can visualize microglia in the brain and see how they uh, interact with neuron, even the calcium activity in, in microglia, you know, how that's important for microglia function. So that's a kind of in vivo imaging well, we, we've been using for a long time. So the, 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 the microglia have those GI receptors, like P212, even complement C3 receptor. Those are all G, GI couple receptor okay. and the control the dynamics of yeah. the microglia. Yeah. yeah. And what, so what are you doing? Uh, you talked about the, you know, spinal cord stimulation and that company, but what's going on with translational research and, and new therapeutic approaches to, well, we talked a lot about pain, but also brain injury, Alzheimer's disease, and so on. Uh, and neurodegeneration, right? Yeah, neurodegeneration. That's uh, something, you know, the, 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 the paper we recently published together on, on Nature Neuroscience on the TRIM2 in TDB43 neurodegeneration. That's something we're extremely excited about that. So what we found is that microglia actually used TRIM2 to recognize the TDB43. And so what is we, trem, what is trem two? A tre, oh yeah, trem two is called triggering receptor expressed in myeloid cells. That's a receptor in uh, in the brain, mostly in microglia or uh, mm -hmm. in macrophage. But but it's important because uh, there is two uh, paper now published more than ten years ago now in the United General Medicine back to back show this trem two mutation actually increase the risk of uh, AD like mm -hmm. three four times uh, risk like. That's really, really yeah. showing the microglia importance because that receptor mostly in the mm -hmm. microglia in the brain. The mutation in that receptor causes AD, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or increase the risk of AD. Yeah. That's get people very excited about microglia function, the trim two function, and also the uh, uh, the, the microglia function in in, a, in Alzheimer neurodegeneration. But later also in the uh, the GWAS data show in the other neurodegeneration like LS FTD, yeah. this trim two mutation seems also important. That's how we we are excited about this re receptor, and then we borrowed the model that time was developing your lab. Young was doing that in your lab viral model. So so we study how microglia respond to this TDB four neurodegeneration, and we found that TRIM two is a key player to recognize TDB forty three. And we later we use all this mass back, you know. A co IP and a, a, a computer a computational simulation to show that TDB43 can bind to the TRIM2. So, directly bind to TRIM2. We even map out where the binding site, right? So, then the microglia use TRIM2 to, to, to bind TDB43, and then they're phagocyte. Yeah. So, now the translational, I mean, the follow up uh, work is that 
can we boost the uh, TRIM2 function, right, to treat like a LS, TDP 42 neural degeneration like a LS or FTD. So that's kind of follow up a very exciting work, um, a more translational, uh, like a, like a, like a uh, aspect of our, our research. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is great. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, science is a lot of fun and exciting every day, right? And there's something new. Right. I mean, the most exciting part is uh, one of the we using our imaging approach. Uh, actually, is uh, we very uh, we observed a very uh, unexpected findings that you know when we op when we have anesthesia, the mice you know quiet down, the like brain quiet down. We found microglia motility or uh, the activity increased. That's something you know is very unexpected, right? Yeah. Because when we study seizure, we found when we have neuronal hyperactivity, microglia follow. So yeah. we already think microglia follow neural activity. But then we found this U shape uh, uh, like a response of microglia to neural activity. So when there's neural activity shut down, like there is a when there's anesthesia, we found microglia also increase the dynamics and then interact with neurons, interact with synapse. Um, and then we are, we we actually recently published that microglia actually can promote even neural activity. We talk about microglia damping neural activity in, in seizure, right? But then we found that when there's neuronal activity shut down, microglia can promote neuronal activity, can bring the activity up because uh, because uh, they found that like they need help. So so that's kind of like U shape uh, response of microglia. And which, which anesthetic did you use for those experiments? So we use mostly used ice flooring. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, we use ice flooring uh, uh, like inhaled like yep. like uh, the, the mice, and then and then then we. Because when we do the imaging, right, it's head fixed. So, and uh, then we can use this uh, ice flooring to, to let them like uh, more like sleep there and, and visual, visualize them. But the most study, you know, most in in imaging was done by anesthesia when did an anesthesia. That's how we got excited because, you know, we found that during anesthesia and, you can, and uh, during the wake, it's uh, microglia dynamics are completely different. That's kind of like some, uh, exciting, exciting observation, and then we we study the mechanism is uh, depend on the norepinephrine uh, uh, um, like uh, mm -hmm. regulation of microglia. So the microglia have this norepinephrine receptor; they can sense this. Uh, you know, when they wake, there's more norepinephrine. They can restrain microglia dynamics, right? But when there is uh, anesthesia, it's more like disinhibition. There's, you have a less norepinephrine. Now the microglia now can 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 have more motility now. Um, it's, it would be it, it would be interesting to look at ketamine too, right? And yes. Which it's high dose, it's anesthetic, and then it, at, interestingly, at, at lower doses, it can induce hallucinations. Right, right. Almost so the like, same is not very known where that, but but I mean the MD receptor, right? The main target. Yeah. The ketamine. So so we did actually the anesthetics for that early studies about how microglia respond to the anesthetics. We, we actually did the ketamine zycine and we found oh. same things that when you use ketamine zycine, microglia also increase dynamics, right? That probably is higher, relative higher dose because it's more like anesthetic dose, right? Yeah. Uh, but it will be interesting to see if the low dose, you know, neural activity differently, whether microglia will, I'm, 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 I assume microglia will respond differently as well, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's so many experiments you can think of. Now I'm thinking of doing an experiment where you look at microglia dynamics in uh, animals given like psychedelics, you know, psilocybin or LSD, and then look like in the prefrontal cortex where a lot of the evidence suggests the the um, well the psychedelic experience may involve changes in neural network activity in the prefrontal cortex. Right, right, right. So all probably, you can get a whole these... other grant. <laughs> exactly, <on> exactly. <laughs> but think about all this dynamic change, what that means, right? Still don't know very well, but yeah. we assume that every movement maybe is meaningful because they move, maybe they move to the synaptic structure or move to cell body interact with, you know, the, the synapse on the cell body. But, but we don't know because that's just a, so much work, right? So like for microglia move around, and then we, the next step is try to understand how the microglia, this dynamics translate to the neuronal function, like a circuit function, because 
they have to be engaged into the circuits, right? When they move, they engage in the, the neuronal circuits and how they can uh, regulate these neuronal circuits. I mean, not just during development, but even in adult brain, right? How they regulate plasticity, yeah. right? So not plasticity, these are not, not well known. So, so that's kind of active topic we're working right now in the lab. Microglia produce serotonin? Well, microglia respond to serotonin. They respond to serotonin. Yeah, so microglia have a ser interesting, if you put the serotonin there, microglia also move to serotonin. Not many neurotransmitter can do that, but serotonin is one of them. They have the they have a, a 5 H, uh, HT2B receptor. Seems like it's important for the microglia uh, chemotaxis to the serotonin. So there's and another, the yeah, complement C3A, that's one, another one can drive the microglia chemotax ATP well, well established. Only a few, few uh, uh, neurotransmitter or you know, neuronal factors can e induce microglia chem direct chemotaxis. But even that, right, in the, you know, the microglia chemotaxis is different from their basal motility. So in a, for example, in the P2R12 knockoff, you cannot go to, the, go to the ATP or injury, but they still move around, right? So there's some microglia, that still don't know. So like this movement, is that just random or is that some signal drive them move around? Yeah. Right. This is all not, not, not known, right? You know, if we know that, then we can, con we can manipulate this movement. Then we can study their function. So right mm -hmm. now we don't know their function because we don't know even how this happened, right? Yeah. It's a lot of unknown question, but that makes the field so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, and to finish up, you want to talk a little bit about the um, University of Te Texas Health Science Center at Houston and the, the programs you're going to be involved in and kind of give yes, up? Yes, yes. That's, that's something uh, so exciting for me now. It's like to start a new center on the topic I, I love so much. So our, our new center's name is called Center for Neuroimmunology and Gliobiology. So it's a one of eight centers in the Institute of Molecular Medicine in UT House Houston. So, um, so we are right now, you know, we just started, um, we launched the center this January, although my official appointment started in March, uh, Dean wanted me to start a center earlier. So we, we launched the center this January. So now we are actively recruiting the, the faculty uh, um, for, for our, our new center on this, this uh, exciting topic, right? As I mentioned, the, the long-term mission is that we, we have this research center is so we want to understand, it's because this neuroimmunology or gliobiology is so important. We want to understand this interaction or communication between nervous system and immune system. And then by understanding them, then how can we use the, the harness their power to, to the neuroimmune power to treat brain diseases. I think about the cancer immunotherapy, the same idea, right? So use the, the immune cell to treat cancer. Yeah. Now our brain have our own right. immune system in the brain. How can we use our brain and immune system to treat brain diseases, right? Yeah. I think that will be the, the future of uh, uh, the, 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 the neuroscience or ne neurology of treating brain disorders. Because right now so many brain, so many brain disorders we cannot treat because we don't understand. And uh, like the, for the, for example, in our brain more glial cell than, than neurons, but all the neuroscience, Therapeutics mostly target neurons. You know, yeah. sometimes maybe it's just one target. Yeah. You know, we we ignore that like not half of the brain. So so yeah. we want really want to break into that black box and use that their power to treat brain diseases. That's kind of the center why we want to start a center and also the the, the future. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Have you, are you going to try to recruit Young Lu? <laughs> yeah, he will be hard. He 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 is so. Ex it's so happy. I, I recently talked with him. He, okay. he he's doing great work in, in China. He's just happy there. I I love to recruit him. Back. He has family back there too, right? Yeah, yeah. Also one of the family uh, family reasons as well. But then um, I I would like to invite you to our center. And or if you want to do sabbatical in my place, you know, you always have a, such a exciting. Well, uh, with the you know this pain okay. issues I've got, this peripheral neuropathy and stuff. I'm I'm not traveling much, but we'll see. On the other hand, you know, my wife is from Texas and uh, her father passed away a couple of years ago. Her mother's still alive and, you know, she or sometimes I go back to there. Uh, 
she's her family's in Waxahachie, Texas. It's just south of Dallas. Oh, oh. And, but she has a brother that lives by Houston. So uh, we'll we'll see. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it would be good to welcome you to to Houston to visit Houston. And <laughs> you were you were from Mayo before, right? You were from Rochester. Yeah, I went to Mayo High School. Exactly. Now we in last, in one time I I was uh, I invite you to to over right. So then you have a meeting or something and then cannot make it. But yeah. I, no, uh, I, I came. I, I came. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the I, I visited your lab. I can't remember if I gave a talk oh, or not. Oh, that that was in New Jersey. I invite you. That was in New Jersey. And then one time I want to invite you to to mail. So that was in New Jersey. We we uh, I invite. I I met you when I. Uh, I thought I came to mail. <laughs> you you were in mail too, but but that time you were in mail for some meeting. I was not here. Oh, so we, oh, we oh that's right. Yeah, yeah, but but and then then we didn't get a chance to to meet. Uh, um, um, but I then that's how I know you 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 were from this area. <laughs> but I invite you to New Jersey when I was at Rutgers. Yeah, that's right. Oh, so, yeah, we were Rutgers, and uh, we we we'll discussed about the collaboration on this TV for New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, exactly. You have children? Yes. Um, my my daughter, uh, Sophia, she's fourteen, and she's with my ex-wife in Toronto. So uh, uh, I have a little one. I have a little one, Cordelia, like uh, uh, almost uh, almost one year now. Uh, she's with her mom uh, in Michigan. So I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I travel a lot. So my wife okay. uh, is a literature professor in uh, uh, Mich uh, in Michigan State University. Yeah. Oh wow! Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it was great to see you again. Uh, Longjun, and uh, to learn about your work, I know in, in an hour, we really can't go into a lot of detail and cover all the details, but hopefully listeners and viewers will have kind of a bird's eye view of, of the progress that's being made in studying these fascinating cells in the brain and spinal cord, the microglia, and the emerging evidence that these things, they're not just important for injury uh, or infection. They're very important in normal brain function and and probably abnormalities in microglia or their responses may be involved in neurodegenerative disorders of aging and other disorders. So I, I will put in the description section links to a number of uh, Dr. Wu's important papers and, and he had a recent review article in Trends in Neurosciences, so I'll put a link to that. People can read up and get some details on what we've been talking about. Yeah, we got one cover imaging for that Trends in Neuroscience. Very nice one. We call Michael Glee on fire. <laughs> on that, <laughs> that Trends in Neuroscience, we're excited about that. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me, Mark. It's okay. a great to see you again. It's great to see you. Um, have a good I hope your transition goes smoothly and you get up and running in Houston. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, bye. bye, -bye.